Well, he was active in Gaines Mill. He was at Second Manassas. He was um, at Fredericksburg. But the but his soldiers fondly called him in the Fifth Texas Aunt Polly because he was very close to his men. He really was concerned about their health, about how they were feeling, how he can help them, which is kind of unusual for a for a colonel of a regiment to really care about his troops like that. Jerome Robertson's story begins on March the 14th, 1815, when he was born to Scottish immigrants Cornelius and Clarissa Robertson in Woodford County, Kentucky. When Jerome was just four years old, his father passed away, and that left his mother penniless. One of five children and the oldest son, Jerome, as was the custom of the time, was apprenticed to a hatter when he was eight. Five years later, Jerome's master moved to St. Louis, Missouri. After five more years of industrious and demanding labor, when he was 18, Jerome was able to buy back the remainder of his contract. During this time in St. Louis, Jerome was befriended by Dr. W. Harris, who educated him in literary subjects. The doctor was so taken with Robertson that he helped Jerome return to Kentucky and attend Transylvania University Medical School. His parents were actually from Scotland. And so he was a first generation Texan or United States citizen back then. And he became a doctor from Transylvania University. And then not too long after he became a doctor, he, he heard about the Texas Revolution and he wanted to, he traveled to Texas to be part of it, but he arrived too late. Although late for the Battle of San Jacinto, Robertson remained a captain in the Republic of Texas Army. He settled in Washington on the Brazos and resumed his medical practice. His brother, mother, and a few friends from Kentucky relocated there to join him. One of those former Kentuckians was longtime friend Mary Elizabeth Cummins. On March the 4th, 1838, Jerome and Mary were married. Over the next several years, they had three children, Felix, Julia, and Henry, who died at the age of two in 1860. In addition to his medical practice, Robertson earned the reputation as an Indian fighter and in 1839 was elected mayor of Washington on the Brazos and its postmaster in 1843. In 1845, Jerome and Mary moved 14 miles away to Independence, Texas, then the home of Baylor University. He was elected as a state representative in 1847 and a state senator in 1849. In January of 1861, Robertson was elected to represent Washington County at the Secession Convention in Austin and was one of the 166 delegates who voted to leave the Union. When uh, he joined the Army, he raised a company from Independence that became part of the 5th Texas. And he was a captain. Then he was promoted over the ranks and he became a lieutenant colonel. On August the 3rd of 1861, Robertson was elected captain of his company. Two months later, he was promoted to lieutenant colonel of the 5th Texas Infantry Regiment. In June of 1862, he was promoted again to full colonel and assumed command of the 5th Texas from James J. Archer. By 1862, the Texas Brigade under the command of General Hood was comprised of four regiments, the 3 Texas, the 1st, 4th, and 5th, and the 18th Georgia, with a combined strength of more than 2,000 men. The summer campaign of 1862 was an arduous one for the Army of Northern Virginia, though. Colonel Robertson was wounded in the shoulder at Gaines Mill in June, and in August, during the Second Battle of Manassas, the right of Robertson's regiment pushed far ahead of the rest of the line. 
Robertson rushed his men forward, leading them on horseback. That brave move cost him another wound, this time in the groin. In spite of his injury, though, Robertson was determined to lead his men north into Maryland. However, the combination of summer heat and persistent pain from his wounds was too much for him. He was overcome with exhaustion and collapsed near Boonesboro Gap in September of 1862 and missed the Battle of Sharpsburg while recuperating. In November 1862, Robert E. Lee reorganized the Army of Northern Virginia. The 18th Georgia Infantry was reassigned to Benning's Georgia Brigade, and the 3rd Arkansas, sometimes jokingly called the 3rd Texas, was assigned to the Texas Brigade. John Bell Hood finally got his promotion to Major General and was assigned as the permanent division commander, something that he'd been doing on a temporary basis. Jerome Robertson was promoted to Brigadier General and given command of the Texas Brigade, although it would forever be known as Hood's Texas Brigade. At the Battle of Gettysburg, Jerome B. Robertson is in charge of the Texas Brigade. He was promoted to Colonel, um, and then he was uh, promoted to Brigadier General, and then he took over his Texas Brigade when John Bell Hood was promoted to be the division commander. Even though it's called Hood's Texas Brigade, it, actually at the Battle of Gettysburg, it was Robertson's Texas Brigade, and he was um, wounded kind of early in the charge. He didn't really see that much action, but he was noted for saying to his men, okay, men, see that rail fence, take the bottom rail and heave it over and let's go charge. And so he was known for that. And he was wounded kind of early in the action. And so he didn't see what the end result was. By early evening on July the 4th, the remnants of the Confederate Army, along with about 4,000 prisoners, withdrew from the battlefield and began a long trek on the road to Hagerstown, headed towards the Potomac. Val Giles wrote that it rained all night long and there was a lightning storm as the brigade approached and crossed the Potomac on July the 14th. The Great Northern Invasion was over and the Texas Brigade would never again cross the Potomac River. They marched through Martinsburg, Bunker Hill, and through Chester's Gap before reaching Culpeper Courthouse, where they would camp until July the 31st. On the 31st, Robertson's brigade broke camp, crossed the Rapidan River, and marched to Fredericksburg, where they would rest and refit for a month. In late August 1863, James Longstreet's plan to send Hood's and Lafayette McClaw's divisions south to reinforce Braxton Bragg's Army of the Tennessee was approved. And by the second week of September, Robertson and the Texas Brigade left their camp along the Rappahannock River for the train ride south. They were headed to the Battle of Chickamauga. We're at the Chickamauga National Battlefield at the tablet for Robertson's Texas Brigade. The Vineyard Alexander Road is just to my right, and behind me in the distance you can see Lafayette Road. On September the 19th and the 20th, Robertson led the Texans into the Vineyard Field East, and behind me on the other side of Lafayette Road, the fighting was so intense that Val Giles described Chickamauga as a veritable hell on earth. Mid-morning on the 20th, the Texans moved about a half a mile to the east, closer to the Brotherton cabin, and were part of the attack across Lafayette Road that took advantage of a hole in the Union lines and routed the Federals. It was the Hood's Tex or Robertson's Texas Brigade that actually went through the gap that was created by in the Union line, and that really helped the Confederates win the victory at Chickamauga. After the Texans fell back into these woods just east of the Dyer Field, John Bell Hood rode up to help his officers launch a counterattack. While Hood and Robertson talked, Hood was wounded in his left leg by a Union shot. The wound was severe enough that his leg had to be amputated, indirectly causing Jerome Robertson's downfall and removal from office. So, at the Battle of Chickamauga, he leads his brigade again, and Unfortunately, by 1863, after the Battle of Chickamauga, he is friends with Evander Law, who took over for Hood, from General Hood when he was wounded at Gettysburg. Then the division became part of Evander Law from Alabama. And Evander Law also not only was in charge of the Texas troops, but also the Alabama Brigade that was named after Law's Alabama Brigade. There was a quite contentious rivalry between Evander Law and Micah Jenkins from South Carolina because they, knew, they wanted to know who was in charge. 
And Evander Law said, well, I was, I was promoted to uh, become the commander at uh, Chickamauga because General Hood was wounded again, so I took over from General Hood. Well, Michael Jenkins said, well, yeah, but I was senior to you. So there was a big robbery. Well, Michael Jenkins was friends with General James Longstreet. And so I'm sure General, uh, Brigadier General Jenkins whispered to his ear about, you know, the bad parts of Evander Law. And unfortunately, Brigadier General Robertson was killed by association because he was friends with Evander Law. And there was rumors that General Robertson was drunk and he was incompetent. And I think that probably came from Michael Jenkins. And so there was a court martial. And even though he did beat the court martial, uh, General Robertson is sent back to Texas and he never goes back to the Army of Virginia again. He spends the rest of the war in Texas. Robertson's war was effectively over. He came back to Texas and was appointed head of the Texas Reserve Forces and held that position until the end of the war. During his time with the Texas Brigade, he'd raised a company of men, the Texas Aides, Company I, the 5th Texas Infantry, and was their captain. He was the lieutenant colonel of the 5th at the Battle of Eltham's Landing. He commanded the 5th Texas at the Battles of Gaines Mill and 2nd Manassas. And as a brigadier general, he commanded the Texas Brigade at Gettysburg, Fredericksburg, and Chickamauga. In all, Jerome Robertson served as the commander of the Texas Brigade longer than any other general, including John Bell Hood. At the close of the war, Robertson returned to independence and resumed his medical practice. In 1872, Robertson was instrumental in the formation of the Hood's Texas Brigade Association and served as its president 11 times, more than any other person. In 1874, he was appointed the superintendent of the Texas Bureau of Immigration. Robertson relocated to Waco in 1879 and worked in the railroad industry. He died on January the 7th, 1890, and is buried in the Oakwood Cemetery in Waco, Texas. <laughs>